Anything else you want to say about Dracula before we move on? Dracula. Dracula's a bitch. No, I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I am Alex Cash, and I am joined today by Brian Anders. In this episode, we're talking all things spooky and creepy Golden Age Batman. Are you ready to find out about what goes bump in the night, Brian? Uh, yeah. It's been a minute. I'm super stoked about it. Me too. Halloween is probably my favorite holiday normally around the house. I do all the decorations. We have like a blow-up spider. My toddler, my son, loves it. He goes, spider, spider, spider. <laughs> That's fun. Tonight when we were having dinner, I was playing the like spooky, scary skeletons, the, whatever that album is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was playing that. Calvin was enjoying it quite a bit. We don't have any like Halloween costumes yet. We changed our, our doormat, mm-hmm. which I don't know if that counts. I think it counts. And we've always talked about getting stuff. So we might we might actually do it this year. Um, do you have a like a costume or anything? Yes. So Clark wanted to be a firefighter. He got very excited about being a firefighter. So he has a I costume. Bet. He's actually he loves tried firefighters, it on. right? Yes. He runs around the house in his costume saying firefighter, firefighter, firefighter. <laughs> um, so we had to hide it. <laughs> to hide it. Yeah. Cause like he was, awesome. he would go try to get it and put it on. And we, we have historically done themed things. Like one year I was the Mad Hatter and Brie was the queen of hearts and Luna was Alice, our little dog. We dressed oh, her up nice. in a little blue dress. So to go along with the fire stuff, I am a Taco Bell hot sauce packet. Oh, whoa. Yeah. And, and Brie, my wife is, is a Fleming hot Cheetos. Oh, I love that. Yeah. To go with the firefighter, man, that's good. Because when you Google it, you're like, you know, um, family firefighter, you know, costume theme or whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of like people burning houses or like they're all firefighters. <laughs> and you got like a firefighter and two burn victims. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I don't want to be on fire. So we, we got creative with it. It's going to be a hot family. Dig it. <laughs> yeah. So j- because of my love for this, I couldn't help but try to choose some topics that are pretty standard for us, pretty typical for sure. us. We're not going to go too far off the beaten path, but but have a little bit of a Halloween valence to them. So Nice. In our third episode of the show, we covered the inspirations for Batman. And the inspirations we talked about were Da Vinci's Ornithopter, Zorro, The Shadow, and a 1930s movie called The Bat Whispers. But before we dove in, I mentioned and immediately dismissed <laughs> two inspirations as obvious. Those were Sherlock Holmes, which we'll talk about in a future episode, Mm -hmm. and Dracula. What you didn't hear in that episode was Brian challenging those as obvious (laughs) and asking me (laughs) to cover them, and I wasn't prepared at all. And so all of that conversation hit the cutting room floor. In fact, there's a funny little clip we stuck at the beginning where Brian says, like, what was it? I'm we're listening to the sound of Alex read books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like me desperately trying to figure out what the heck Dracula has to do with Batman. <laughs> like being put on the spot. And uh, as you might be able to tell six episodes into this show, open questions like this drive me banana sandwich. I cannot let stuff like this go. So today in honor of Halloween, I thought we would talk uh, a bunch about Dracula, Dracula and a little bit. About how it has to do with Batman. So great. Don't worry if you want the straight uncut Batman content. Uh, um, If you want a story, use the chapter marker, skip ahead. Second half of the show, we'll talk all about some Golden Age Batman again. But but for a minute, we're going to talk about Dracula. How's that sound? That sounds good to me. If if anyone is like thinking about skipping ahead, I can almost promise that this will be really interesting. (laughs) There's some good tidbits. I I know you're all about the the, the random facts. We're going to take all about the tidbits. Yeah, we're going to get off the beaten path just because I think there's some really cool stuff to talk about. Um, Let's do it. So how do we know that Dracula is an inspiration for Batman? The the thing that I was citing in that that episode, the second episode of the show, was from Les Daniels' book, Batman the Complete History. That's the 1999 one that Mark Tyler Nobleman was talking about. Um, It had the the quotes from from uh, Bill Finger that that weren't cited and he couldn't find them for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and it's super brief. It's got like a sentence where it says that Bob Kane, quote, admitted that Bela Lugosi's Dracula was an inspiration. And so that's that's how I came w- with that. But digging a little bit more, um, I found an article written by Tom Andre, who we know as the ghostwriter for Batman and Me, the Bob Kane autobiography. Um, Mm -hmm. He wrote an essay, uh, an article titled The Darkest Night, The Gothic Roots of Batman Comics, which was included in the fall 2020 edition of an academic journal called Source, Notes in the History of Art. 
And that article is super interesting um, because it talks about like less like the specific inspirations like this book or this TV show and more about like sort of the the sociological climate that Batman is born from. It's available on the University of Chicago Press website. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. But in that in that article, he says, quote, white upper class males like Bruce Wayne were thought to exemplify the highest level of rationality and self-control. Kane modeled the look of Batman on Bela Lugosi's Dracula, and the Dark Knight functions as a double of the villain he fights. He represents the acme of heroic development by being able to both access the savage, primordial instincts manifested by villains and direct his violent impulses solely against criminals. It's also the case that this article cites Tom Andre cites himself, which I think is like a total badass move. <laughs> like when you're being pu- published in an academic journal, you've got a footnote that points to your own book. Um, there's a 20, 2011 book that he wrote called Creators of the Superheroes, where he's he's specifically citing this quote that from Bob Kane. I now desperately want to read this book. Unfortunately, there's no ebooks available. Ooh. And I couldn't get a book delivered in time for this episode. But uh, <laughs> rest assured, I, I will be That's diving awesome. deep. OK, so what is Dracula? Who is Dracula? Dracula is an 1897 novel written by a man named Braun Stoker. Mm-hmm. It's what they call an epistolary novel which means that it's comprised of letters and other documents. And Dracula is not the only uh, example of an epistolary novel. It's not even the first, but it is one of the most famous. It consists of diary entries, newspaper clippings, telegrams, letters. Think of it like a found footage film, like Cloverfield. Mm -hmm. Wow. You chose Cloverfield as the found footage film. (laughs) That's the one that I go to. What's your, what do you, what comes to your mind? Well, the first thing, the two things that come to mind, which one's more a little bit, a little bit more modern is a paranormal activity. Okay. Yeah. That was super popular when we were in college. And then uh, the Blair Witch Project, which is like one of the OGs. I think the thing with Blair Witch Project was that was what, like 1999. So I was, Uh, something like that. It was something like that. It was rated R. So I was too young. So I didn't see it Mm -hmm. when it came out. And Cloverfield was, I must've been like a freshman in high school. Um, At that point, it was like 2004 or something like that. Totally Mm -hmm. speaking off the cuff. I have no idea. But it was right in that sweet spot where I had like, I had figured out how to use BitTorrent. (laughs) Oh, yeah. yeah. So I remember it. it, So I I watched it right when it came out. And so that that was the defining one for me. Um, I'm pretty sure J.J. Abrams directed that. um, Cloverfield? I don't know. I think it is a bad robot thing, but I don't know if he directed it. Produced by J.J. Abrams. Directed by Matt Reeves. Okay. Directed by Matt Reeves, who went on to direct batman the batman <laughs> the batman okay i thought yes. so i was like oh no i'm on the spot <laughs> yes yeah the, the the 2022 moving picture film on which next episode will be I'm okay i was wondering it. when that was going to come out yeah i'm editing it as we speak awesome well good luck yes <laughs> it, it could be a two-parter <laughs> it might be that was like a four-hour conversation that was a long one yeah Super fun, though. So, yeah, like, I remember when I started reading Dracula and I was telling Brian that this might be something that we talk about on the show. And I was like, oh, you, you it's like a found footage thing. And Brian was like, oh, yeah, like World War Z. And I felt, like, really smart for, like, observing this. But if it's the first thing that comes up if you Google, like, you know, you know, what is Dracula? <laughs> the book, right? Like, if you go to Spark Notes, like, everyone's like, oh, it's an epistolary. You know, it's like a found footage film. I'm like, oh, okay. So that comparison is obvious. But <laughs> I also... You, when you said you were reading it, I was like, dang, like I, I'm one of those people who just like, I stay away from reading really old books because <laughs> usually they suck. Um, it's not a bad book. <laughs> it's not a bad book. It's, it's, um, okay. one of those things where it, in order to set the mood, especially towards mm-hmm. the beginning of the novel, it does a lot of like referencing sort of, um, geography and sort of ethnic groups and things like that, that you won't get. At first, so yeah. that for me, it was a lot of like flipping back and forth between the edition that I had. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, had notes at the end that was like explaining like anachronisms and 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 sort of like you know references. Right, because of the time, it would have been like different types of stereotypes that they were applying to people. Like ah, oh, those Hungarians. That's everyone right. knows about Hungarians. It's yes, like, yes, yes, yes. I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it's tough in that regard, but otherwise it, it was it was not so bad to read. I, I do recommend okay, it. Okay, cool. I guess I should reel back a little bit. Yeah. Old books usually are written in a certain tone or a certain cadence or something that makes sure. them really unfun to, for me to yes. read. But the stories are usually t- completely fine. Yeah, and Dracula is challenging uh, a, a bit. Uh, we'll talk about it more in here in a minute. 
what's what is interesting about the fact that it's an epistolary novel is that it, the the diary entries and the letters themselves are narrative devices so there's parts in the novel where like you know Jonathan Harker one of the characters is like trying to send a letter and and the letter is one of the things in the book and Dracula like intercepts it so it doesn't reach the final person or like he's he like goes back to get his diary, which is the diary you are reading, right? Oh, dang. Okay. That's so fine. yeah, they like play, they play a part in the story, it's which is meta. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a neat device. It's not necessarily a long novel, but a lot happens in it. It does mm-hmm. ramble, kind of goes all over the place a little bit. So it's hard to summarize, but I'll give it a go. It starts with Jonathan Harker, who's a British okay. lawyer, mm-hmm. and he's traveling from England to Transylvania on business. He's been tasked to meet with Count Dracula, who is just a person. He's, you know, um, nobility in Transylvania, right? Yeah. Um, so so I guess it should be noted that, like, the people who read this for the first time, there was no meaning behind Count Dracula, right? right? <laughs> like, he was just some Count Count Brian, right? Yes, and yes. And it turns out that... Okay. Yeah, there, there, there is um, sort of a metatextual reference of the name Dracula itself, but it's likely that sure. most people who are reading it in England in the late 1800s when this was written didn't know. Yeah. Um, I always wonder what it's like to like read these types of things for the first time, where like the surprise is like a real surprise. Sure. Whereas like we could read this now and you'd be like, well, everyone knows Dracula means yeah, he's the vampire. A vampire. He's gonna go visit the vampire, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> But the um, people who read this and just like don't know, they didn't just, know that oh, so his name's just Dracula, whatever. Yeah, just just a guy, um, just a guy. And and Dracula has um, contracted with Jonathan Harker's law firm to purchase real estate in London, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's why Jonathan Harker's going there. They're like crossing T's, dot and I's for him to buy, you know, a sure. place for him to live because he wants to come live in London. And at first, Harker is a guest of Dracula, but then the count asks him to stay a while and help him get better at his English, right? Um, he's like, Oh, my diction's not very good. I can't pronounce stuff right. You know? And slowly over time, Harker comes to realize that he's not a guest, but he's imprisoned. Right. <laughs> there, yeah. Well, also like, how weird is it that you're like, well, you said the lawyer, right? Like yes. I brought my lawyer who's now going to teach me English. Yes. Like what kind of a lawyer is like, yeah, I can teach English. Eh, yeah. <laughs> it's worth my time. Well, That's not to weird. mention, like, the, a, a big passage at the beginning of the story is him, like, trying to get to, to Count Dracula's castle, right? So, like, he's, like, taking a stagecoach and then getting dropped off and picked up another. And, like, every time he explains where he's going, like, people are, like, going, oh, no, like, you know, doing the, the you know, Catholic cross. And, like, at one point, someone gives mm-hmm. him, like, a, a cross necklace for, to wear and they're, like, saying prayers and they're, like, freaking out. And he's, like, wow. you know, so there's this kind of signs that, like, Ominous. maybe this place is, yeah. yeah. And he's, like, well, it's just a dude, you know. This is part of my job, like. Totally. And if, if all else fails, I can sue him, right? Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> there's certain parts of the castle he's not supposed to be in. And in particular, there's a room that he finds uh, later on and breaks into that has a big grand balcony with a view of the courtyard and other parts of the castle. And in this room, he observes the count climbing on all fours, head first down the side of a castle. Like he gets oh, out of a wow. window and crawls down. It's like a super creepy, unsettling. And the book is like really good at these sort of like just – setting of the vibe of just being like something's off right and there's just these moments that they really build up to and and punctuate like for whatever reason everyone talks about those specific moments where that thing happens and and when you're reading it you feel that right like oh crap like he's crawling down the the castle right he also (laughs) he falls asleep in this room at a later point in the book um, which is something he's not supposed to do. He's not supposed to fall asleep anywhere except inside of his room he's been directed by Count Dracula and he wakes up and there's these three young women who start to like seduce him. Like they're going to go to pound town. Right. <laughs> and they're going in for like the kiss and Dracula like barges in and he says, leave him to me. He's mine. And like shoes them away. Right. And Harker passes out and then like wakes up in his bed. Right. So kind of this really wild moment is another one that like everyone always talks about. Does he think, does he think it was real since he wakes up in his bed? Yeah, he does. Or does he? Okay. Yeah. He's, and that's, there's, there's sort of like a, a sort of like psychological horror. You're like living in this guy's mind of like, he's freaking out because he can't get out. Yeah. He's trying to like plan his escape. Like, yeah. and there's the, there's the scene where like he cuts himself while he's shaving and like Dracula's like really wanting his blood. Like he's acting really weird yeah. or like, um, while he's shaving, he has the mirror. Right. And, Dracula's not in it and he freaks out, right? There's oh, lots of moments where he starts to realize things are wrong. So he does eventually escape. We don't really have an account of that. He just like writes about how he's getting ready to escape. And then later he wakes up in a hospital 
um, with like mind fever or whatever brain fever, <clears throat> um, which is kind of cool. Cause like, it's how a diary might actually be written. Like he's not writing while he's like going. Yeah. So yeah, wakes up in a Budapest hospital, not remembering what happened. That's like the first third of the book. And that's like my favorite part. Um, cause it's just this existential horror and dread. Mm -hmm. The book then jumps to two women, Lucy Westenra and Mina Murray. They're in an English coastal town called Whitby. And this is actually where Bram Stoker spent a lot of time when he was writing his book, he would visit Whitby. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And Mina is Jonathan Harker's fiance. So that's how she's related to this. She's visiting Lucy who lives there in Whitby. And Lucy does a bunch of sleepwalking, right? That's kind of the thing that, that Lucy is documenting in her diary, ent diary entries. Like she goes out and sits on a bench, like on the coast where the, you can hear the water crashing, like think Westcliff drive and like Santa Cruz. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Lucy's like constantly going out and chasing after her and making sure that like, you know, she doesn't end up in the ocean or whatever. And at one point <laughs> they find good friend, two pinpricks on her neck that look kind of like a bite mark. Right. Mm. Concurrently with all this, there's a pretty gruesome shipwreck at Whitby. Like everyone's dead, including like the person who was like steering the boat. He's like tied himself to the, the, the like mast, the steer, or not the mast, the steering wheel. Right. Uh -huh. Cause it's like through a storm or whatever. Yeah. And the way we find out about this is through a newspaper clipping, which is really cool. You're like reading the reporting on it. I'm like, what oh, happened? Cool. How they found people. One question. So you said he tied, like he tied himself to the steering, whatever. Yeah. 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 Did they find his dead body tied to it yes. or Oh my gosh. Yes. It is pretty, pretty creepy. Yeah, that's grisly. And one of the things, um, there's nothing living on the boat except for one of the accounts is that there is a large black dog mm. that runs off the boat. We come to find later that this dog is Dracula. Sidetrack, like oh, at this time, the, the sort of like rule set and lore for what a vampire is is not really set in terms of like modern fiction. In fact, Bram Stoker kind of creates the prototype that everyone follows for vampires. And vampires can transform into anything, right? So, like, in the movies, he's always transforming into really? a bat. Yeah. yeah. In, in the book, he transforms into, into a bat, into a wolf, into, like, mist. To mist? Yeah. Dang. He, like, okay. goes under someone's door anything. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can transform to an apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the sort of, like, in folklore, there's not a huge difference between a vampire and a werewolf. They kind of are, like, adjacent, like, um, myths. Huh. Yeah. Really? Yeah, That's we're really, going to go deeper on that in a bit. Uh, the, so to, total side thought, sure. but it makes me wonder like how this stuff comes back around with, um, was it the Underworld series? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Because they've got like the, the vampires and the, the, versus the, the werewolves, yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, lichens, yeah. and then they start to like have hybrids and stuff. Mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. is that just like kind of coming back together? I don't know. I, do, I, um, I assume that there's some other like foundational fiction that they're building on top of, but, um, probably it's just interesting. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, that happens in parallel. Okay. Another thing that is also happening during all of this is that Lucy on the same day has three dudes that all propose to her th three men. One is, is, uh, an American named Quincy Morris. Another is a, a person that we're probably not going to talk about a ton. <laughs> um, and a third is a, a doctor whose name is John Seward. And so, Dr. Seward shows up and like checks in on Lucy because she's doing all this walking. They find the pinpricks that are a little worried about mm -hmm. her. And he's like, I'm not sure what's going on. I, um, I'm going to send for my mentor, a doctor named Van Helsing. Dang. Yeah. So that's where Van Helsing comes from. Although nothing like any of the movies or anything. Okay. Like that. He's just a doctor. In fact, in the movie, we're going to talk about in a bit, just like a gray, hair, gray haired old dude. Right. Doesn't look like a, a sexy Australian. No. <laughs> Just a doctor. Van Helsing instantly thinks it's a vampire, but doesn't say so because, like, vampires aren't real. And he doesn't want people to freak out, right? They put garlic up around her room, mm -hmm. um, which helps for a while. Because, like, one of the things that is happening concurrently with this is, like, Van Helsing points out that, like, she's really low on blood and she's going to die, right? Because she's, like, losing blood all the time. They don't understand why. So they're, like, doing, like, rotating transfusions. Like, everyone's giving her blood transfusions and she still doesn't have enough blood. But they put up the garlic and it gets better, right? Like, she starts doing better. But... Her mom shows up, <laughs> Lucy's mom, and is like, this garlic is like superstition and it's stupid and we're getting rid of it, which leaves her vulnerable. And then she dies. Right. Dang. After Lucy dies, Van Helsing essentially puts together a posse with all the dudes <laughs> that were like courting Lucy, like all the people who had proposed Quincy Morris and and Seward. And they go to her to her tomb because he's trying to convince them that she's undead. Right. That she's she's a vampire. And it turns out that she is. They, like, witness her, like, sucking the blood of, like, a child. And they murder her. And, like, not just a little bit. Like, they murder her 
hard. <laughs> so yeah. like they drive a stake through her heart, which like uh-huh. for me coming before I read this book, like my, my frame of reference is like, literally I remember being a child and thinking like, this is stupid. Like how like drive a stake through, like my, my mental image is Buffy. Right. I don't know if you've ever watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but she takes a piece of wood and she sort of like taps it against your chest hard and then you instantly turn into dust. Okay. Yeah. Right. But that is not what driving a stake through a human would be like. No, I know some history (laughs) on this too, actually. (laughs) Yeah. So they take like a piece of wood that's sharp and they lay it on her and then they take like a hammer or a crowbar or something heavy and they like pound it into her chest. Right. Yeah. So. One of the so one of the interesting things about that is um, I don't remember what disease it was, uh, but uh, when people died with this particular disease mm-hmm. and they were buried, people would be worried that they were vampires or something, so they yep. would op- dig them up, open them up, and one of the things that they would do to make sure that people weren't or like were not vampires or mm-hmm. would kill them was the stake because it would actually like hold them down to the ground oh wow right? okay i didn't realize yeah that. so that that's where the original like stake was they would stake them down with a big long stake so uh-huh. it would firmly get them in the ground so they'd wake up and just kind of be stuck to the ground forever yeah, 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 yeah the other thing they would do is they would turn them and have them face down because they thought that these vampires would wake up confused and they would try and dig and they would uh, dig downward and be stuck instead of up um, sure or they would just put huge rocks on top of gotcha which I think in some places they still do today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's <clears throat> very interesting. Um, yeah. So not only do they, so back to, back to Lucy, right? Not only do they drive the stake through her heart, then they cut off her head. Then right. they stuff her mouth full of garlic. Oh, okay. Right. And remember, these are the three guys that are like courting her. They've all asked to marry this chick and they come on this expedition thinking this doctor's crazy. And then at the end they're like, Together, they're, like, murdering her, like, hardcore. Pretty wild scene. Hashtag love. Yes. <laughs> Jump back to Budapest. Mina leaves, right? So, at some point during this, she leaves Lucy to go to John, who's written, to call for her. So, she goes back to Budapest. She meets up with him. They get married, right? Because they've been fiancé for months at this point. He's been mm-hmm. missing. It's been, yeah, very traumatic for her. They come back to England, right? And they meet up with everyone, and then Van Helsing's like mega posse, right? Let's take all the dudes that were courting Lucy and Mina and John. Cause now John is like, yeah, Dracula's this vampire dude, you know? And he came to, to, to London, right? Cause he knows that, that he's left. He's been planning to go live at this house or whatever. And they're like, let's get him, Right. So that, that at this point <laughs> it just turns into like action movie, right? Like the, at one point they find these boxes of earth of soil, because in, in this sort of, um, you know, mythical rule set, you know, vampire yeah. canon, it's not that they need to sleep in a coffin because they like a coffin or whatever, or that's, that's the rule set. It's that they need to sleep in the native soil where they would have been buried when they died. Ah, oh, interesting. So he's brought, um, like, I think it's like 23 boxes. It's like many, many boxes of soil from Transylvania with him. And so even though wow. Count Dracula's not there, they start destroying the boxes, which um causes him to flee he's like oh i gotta get back so he goes back to transylvania they chase him there they kill him and that's the end of the book right okay so i think mythology is the word you were looking for yeah yeah so yeah it kind of rambles right the 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 sort of inciting element is that you know dracula like terrorizes um and and they end up killing him but like it's got many characters a lot of them have things to do with each other but they have things to do with each other that like it's just kind of like this wild coincidence right that like you know, Dracula is like terrorizing Jonathan. And then he goes and like terrorizes Mina and her friend who also happens to know like this vampire doctor, right? Like it's kind of a lot of like things like that. I really enjoyed the book though. Out of 10, how many stars? I would say like a seven or eight for sure. I definitely end up, you know, more in love with the, the mythology of Dracula and the idea of Dracula than the book itself. Sure. So that's the story itself. But if you're trying to sort of step back and do a meta textual read, and like understand the sort of like psychological place that this comes from or the themes mm-hmm. of the book. Most academics feel that it's speaking to an anxiety that was prevalent in British literature starting in the Victorian era called reverse colonization. Essentially, the idea is that a strange or superior outsider comes to England, takes the land and or subjugates the people. Really? Yeah. If you have a charitable view of this anxiety, it stems from an empathetic view of the British Empire's impact on others and the inevitability of those chickens coming home to roost. 
if yeah. you do not read it charitably, <laughs> then perhaps <laughs> you could chalk it up as like xenophobia, racism, you know, like fear of miscegenation, right? Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, Dracula does kind of fit this bill. He's a vampire who's tapped out his native land, right? And wants to seek out greener pastures um, in London, which is a target rich environment for him to like drink blood and like yeah. turn people into vampires. Another example of this trope that that academic site uh, or this theme is H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, right? Like it's this idea of like, you know, the aliens coming and um, taking over. So yeah, that's one of the, th- the sort of themes that you could take away. Go ahead. I don't, I, so I don't know if this m- matters at all, but Jack the Ripper, 1888 to 1891 in it, London also. So I don't know yes. if there's parallels there. Yeah. it's so, right before this book. Totally. There is some really, really, really great conversation about sort of like the horror culture and the horror fiction climate Mm -hmm. in Victorian Mm -hmm. England that I would love to talk about. Okay. In fact, there was a whole nother topic for this episode that I cut about another inspiration for Batman um, that I would love to come back for at some point. Okay. And and I think Jack the Ripper dovetails better with that. It's Spring Hill Jack is the one I wanted to talk about. Okay. You had made that reference another time. I just, I think we're going to be here all night if I do it, (laughs) but it's a really good point. It's a really good point. Yeah. We're going to come back for it. Hopefully. I don't know if we're still doing this in a year (laughs) next Halloween, next Halloween, Victorian England, horror, Jack, the Ripper, Spring Hill, Jack. There's another metatextual read that positions the book as a challenge to sexual and gender norms. Mm -hmm. The book is fairly erotic, um, especially the scene where Dracula's wives, we, we come to find out that the three women are his wives. Sure. Are are trying to seduce Harker. And the scene crescendos to this moment where he stops and says, like, he's mine. Right? Like, as if to say that perhaps it's not just, like, drinking his blood, right? But that there's there's sort of, like, an erotic element to that as well. It's pretty clear that, that, that Dracula has an interest in Harker specifically for some reason. And it's not just in that scene, right? Like, there's an infatuation. It's, it's described in pretty sensual terms. Uh, and it's not a stretch to say that there are mm. homoerotic undertones to the book. Um, there are some who, examining Stoker, his personal life, his notes, think that perhaps he had some repressed homosexuality or by curiosity. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't love, personally, the sort of like casual way that we like to discuss dead people <laughs> and their private lives, because um, it's a pretty private matter. Um, yeah. But I do find some of those things persuasive, right? That sure. um, there is especially in Victorian England, right? There is a lot of, you know, people were not in touch with their feelings. Let's say (laughs) there's a lot of things that are repressed and and spoken about in, in sort of abstract and allegorical ways. Right. So it's not, it's not a stretch to say that, that there's some of those themes in this book. So that's the novel who wrote this novel, Bram Stoker. He was an Mm -hmm. Irish guy. He lived Mm -hmm. from 1847 until 1912 in his lifetime. He was most famous for being a business manager for the Lyceum, which is a West end theater in London. It's still there today. Um, it's currently hosting um, Disney's Lion King, the musical. It's been doing that since 1999. And he came to be the business manager there by way of being personal assistant to Sir Henry Irving, who was an actor who owned the Lyceum. He was the first ever actor to receive a knighthood. Kind of a big deal at the time, had an inflated ego. Some people think that Stoker was writing Dracula as perhaps to be inspired by Sir Henry Irving. They were, um, had, they were friends. Oh, interesting. But it was also a, a, a tenuous relationship. In addition to managing the Lyceum, which again, is what he was known for at the time. He was a writer, though he was not particularly financially successful. He wrote for newspapers, um, sometimes was a theater critic for those newspapers, sometimes wrote like fiction a few pages at a time, sort of in serial. And he wrote several novels, one of which is, is Dracula. If you want to know more about him, there is a um, a lecture that was given at uh, Johnson County Community College in Kansas City. Um, no, no way. That I will link. Yeah, it's a really, really good, good lecture. I can't remember the guy's name. Maybe I'll edit it in after. Well, but I'll why put it in the is show it notes. notable that it was Kansas City? Because I'm from Kansas City. <laughs> I think that's interesting. <laughs> it's not notable at all. Just a, there's a no. college professor who gave a talk. I still don't know if the audience knows that. Yeah, but that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so. 1847 and the book was 1897 right? That's right so he was 50 when the book came out yes and he was only 65 when he died in 1912 yeah young young dude really interesting it's interesting to think about life in different sense yeah no it, it, um he's young for today but i don't know if he would have been at the time that's probably a pretty full life um yeah 
in, in, yeah, in the midlife century. crisis for us right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about inspirations for for Dracula, the, the book. Um, mm-hmm. And I'll start by talking about one that everyone uh, knows or is the first one that people hear about that is perhaps definitely overvalued and overstated. Um, and that is Vlad the Impaler. Are you familiar with Vlad the Impaler? I am indeed. I'm pretty sure there's even uh, a, well, what time period was he alive? The 15th century. So mid 14th Oh, way long ago. Okay. There's, yeah. um, there's a Young Indiana Jones episode. I don't know if you've ever watched those. I haven't. I um, where they go to this castle that's overrun by these evil World War I mm-hmm. overlords. And there's this guy who I, I want to say he's, he's been like possessed by Vlad the Impaler's ghost or something. Interesting. And he's just like really, really gruesome. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So who's Vlad the Impaler? Uh, yeah. 15th century. He was the prince of Wallachia. What is Wallachia? Wallachia is a uh, principality. It's a territory. Um, at the time, it was a kingdom, right? That is in modern day Romania. At the time, it was um, sort of sandwiched between the Ottoman Empire to the south and um, Hungary to the north, as well as Transylvania. Transylvania shared a, a northern border with Wallachia. Vlad II, who's Vlad the Impaler's father, joined okay. a group called the Order of the Dragon. And this was a Christian chivalric order that was organized to fight the Ottomans. So basically, amongst sort of, you know, cross countries, there's this sort of Christian organization that is trying to align people to be against the Ottoman Empire, which is, um, you know, a Muslim empire at the time. So this is part of the sort of like post-Roman, you know, Byzantine Empire clash between the, the Christians, the Catholics, specifically Roman Catholics and, and Muslims. Because he joined the Order of the Dragon, he became known as Vlad Dracul or liter- literally no way. Vlad the Dragon. Yes. And much like, that. Okay. yeah, much like we might append son to the end of a surname, Johnson, Isaacson, Williamson, Vlad the Third would become known as Vlad, son of the dragon, or in Romanian, old Romanian, Dracula, Vlad Dracula. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's cool. That's where the name Dracula actually comes from. Um, dragon, essentially, son of the dragon. Yes. Huh. That's great. I'm not super well versed on Vlad the Impaler himself, um, and I'm not going to go too deep. But suffice to say <laughs> that being sandwiched be- between sort of the, the rest of, um, you know, Western Europe. They're, so they're in Southeast Europe and in, in the Balkan Peninsula, right? Yeah. The, being sandwiched between the rest of Europe, which is, which is largely Catholic, and the Ottomans to the south. It's a very tumultuous region, lots of war, and lots of sort of like trying to persuade the rulers of this country. Uh, the, I, I'm going to butcher this. The Voidwadas. Voy, 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 voy does, the kings, the princes, right? Vlad and his father yep. to be aligned with them. So at various points, like they're aligned with the Ottoman Empire and then they're aligned with Hungary, right? It's kind of a proxy war, right? And Vlad the Impaler becomes famous for sort of like putting his foot down and like establishing, you know, that he is like the sole ruler of this country, right? And in a, in a big way being sort of a buttress against the Ottoman Empire and their spread to the rest of Europe. Okay. And the way that he did that was that he was like super, super, super gruesome and super heartless and like showed no mercy and like yeah. impaled people was one of the things that he was known to do. Uh, tortured people, yeah, you know. Put their heads on spikes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And when we, we say impale, right, like we think like maybe we, we're doing something with speed, like we would, uh, you know, take a oh. take a spike and like run it through them. But that's not what we're talking about, right? Like you would like put a person atop, uh, you know, a sharp spike and then, like, let their body weight pull them down over it over the course of, like, days, right? <laughs> and have them that's ride rough. in pain. Yeah, it's pretty rough. So that's how he becomes known as the Impaler. He's a pretty, pretty bad guy. <laughs> um, bad dude. Bad dude. And um, because of the fact that Dracula shared the name with Dracula from Bram Stoker's book, everyone just assumed mm-hmm. that it's the same guy. In fact, there are adaptations, movie adaptations that basically say that he is that like Vlad the Impaler dies, but he's undead. He's a vampire. Yeah. He's living in, mm-hmm. in modern day, right? The Francis Ford Coppola film from 1992 with Gary Oldman and uh, Winona Ryder, Bram Stoker's Dracula does this, right? The, the beginning of the movie, they're talking about, you know, Vlad the Impaler, but we actually have notes that Stoker kept while writing Dracula that were rediscovered and were not published until 1972. And they contain no notes about Vlad the Impaler at all. None. Really? 
None. Yes. Instead, what we do have is notes that he had gone to read a book while researching called, quote, An Account of the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldova, including various political observations relating to them, by a man named William Wilk- Wilkinson. And we, we just know, he, like, one day he went to the library. He was there for, like, I you not, like, 20 minutes, right? <laughs> read this book. And if you go and read this book, it doesn't even really go into detail on Vlad the Impaler. It just lists a bunch of various leaders from the regions and their surnames. So basically, he thought Dracula sounded cool. Um, <laughs> and he had been writing this book for many years and didn't name it Dracula until the last second. His publisher e- had even said that, like, you can't name your your villain, like, the vampire, right? And so <laughs> that's how, um, you know, Dracula's name gets attached to the thing. It's likely mm. that his place in Transylvania as a Balkan state that is kind of in this milieu is related to that that as well. And it goes to show that he really didn't know a whole lot about Vlad the Impaler, that he put it in Transylvania, not Wallachia. Right? Okay, so I feel like I need to pause and go back. So you're saying he didn't know who Vlad the Impaler was, but... <laughs> By choosing the name Dracula, he made this connection to Vlad, son of the dragon. Yes. So the whole Vlad the Impaler thing was a total accident, but is for sure like connected. Yeah. So again, we're working off of notes, right? Yeah. Like reading it a hundred years later. So he this may have is like known. one of those really crazy um, coincidences. Yes. You know. I think it's it's very likely that he may have known who Vlad the Impaler was, and he may have even known that he was making this connection, but it was not mm. what he set out to do when he wrote the book. And he didn't right. take great care to do it, at the very least. Which is kind of wild. Yeah, it is kind of wild. So yeah, if he's not inspired by Vlad the Impaler, what the heck is he inspired by? And he was more inspired by vampires themselves. And um, some earlier English fiction on the subject, we know he read them, he wrote about it in his notes. There was a Penny Dreadful that was running at the time called Varney the Vampire. There was a novel called Carmilla from 1872 and a book simply titled Vampire from 1819. So other English writers had written novels about vampires. He's just doing another one, right? So in our second episode, we talked about like paper to comics and stuff. Did you want to hit on a refresher on what a Penny Dreadful is? Sure. Penny Dreadfuls were basically pamphlets. They're like eight to ten pages. They're really cheap. They're on newsprint, right? They're, They're books that you would read it was like a precursor to not to comics themselves but to pulp fiction that would that would come later the magazines that were sort of serial fiction yeah yeah so that's a good question so yeah varney the vampire big big inspiration was it was a penny the dreadful that was happening i don't want to talk about any of those inspirations specifically but i do think it'll be really interesting to talk about vampires generally and where that concept comes from if you simplify vampires to simply being creatures that drink blood you can find examples in mesopotamian greek Mm -hmm. and roman mythology but if you're looking specifically for the word vampire and a, a legend that's a little bit closer to what we think of a vampire, the first written mention in, in, of this term is from the 11th century in Slavic folklore. So Eastern European. Interesting. Okay. It's generally thought that vampire legends originate as people are trying to understand or explain oddities in the way that the human body decomposes. Yes. Um, yep. So mm-hmm. this is what you were talking about earlier. It is. Yeah. Yeah. After humans die, all kinds of stuff goes sideways, right? Like your blood's Mm -hmm. no longer flowing. So chemical reactions that are normally prevented just by the literal, just by the movement of that blood start to happen or things that chemical reactions that are prevented by like the body temperature, your blood flowing maintains a certain body temperature that stops happening. That starts, starts to occur, right? Like chemical reactions. And so how exactly this manifests depends on a lot of things, including like the temperature where the body is contact with materials. Like are you touching wood or dirt or something else, right? But one of the things that can happen is bloating. Bloating where gases inside you expand and make your gut and torso grow. So your physically yeah. upper body is getting larger oh, yeah, and your lips, lips become plump. And it looks like maybe yeah. you just ate, right? Like you're yeah. feeling pretty full. You look really full. Yeah. Yes. Um, like a mosquito or a tick. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then another thing that can happen is blood is like forced out of your like – of your Mm -hmm. um you know capillaries right out of the skin right it's literally pushed out and it can come out of your mouth and it can come out of your nose right and so you can come you can imagine someone coming to a body that's like got blood coming out of the mouth looking pretty full and you're like i thought this dude was dead right and instead it looks like he was just eating blood right yeah um so let me add to this really quickly um so i i pull up the vampire wikipedia really quick and jump to 
pathology and, and origins and stuff. So there's a section about contagion where it says, um, basically the, as the pneumonic form of bubonic plague it is associated with breakdown of lung tissue, which would cause blood to appear at the lips. So it's right. another thing where you could have blood coming out of your mouth mm -hmm. and, and would be like a, a decent time period uh, for a lot of this folklore to be originating is hundred percent when bubonic plague was ravaging Europe. Yes. Another thing that we associate with vampires is like having long fingernails or canines, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, in modern day, the sort of old wives tale is that these things are attributed to those things continuing to grow after you die. Mm -hmm. Like people say that your hair keeps growing or right. that your fingernails keep growing after you die. Turns out mm -hmm. this isn't true, by the way, that's not what happens. No, not is, true. is your flesh is desiccating. <laughs> Yeah, it's, so, it's like drying out and like pulling back. Yes, yeah. your fingernail stays the same length. Everything else <laughs> sort of retreats, yeah. which is pretty gross. So that's how these legends start, right? And that's what's inspiring to Stoker and inspiring other authors of this time. But it is worth noting that Stoker really solidifies a lot of the rules that we think of for vampires. He does invent a few things himself. For mm -hmm. example, the fact that a vampire has no reflection in a mirror Stoker's the first person to write about that. But even the majority of things, which he doesn't invent, like the shape-shifting and the drinking blood and, like, when he drinks blood, he gets younger and, you know, all of that, you know, fear of garlic and fear of crosses. He doesn't invent all of those things, but he collates them, puts them all in one place and sets up a prototype that a lot of people are, you know, following and continue to follow to, the, to this right. day just because the novel is so popular. So that's how he was inspired. Fast forward. Book's not very successful. He doesn't make a lot of money from any books, right? How does Dracula become relevant? Then, if the book's not a success. In 1922, there's a German film called Nosferatu. It's based mm -hmm. on Dracula. Um, it's a very, very influential horror classic. It's a silent film. It's, you know, got some really interesting filmmaking techniques where, like, they show sort of, like, supernatural powers by, like, you see, like, Nosferatu's, like, shadow. Like, they cast a light, you know, and have a shadow reach out and, like, grab someone. And, like, the person reacts as if they were grabbed. It's a really cool, mm -hmm. like, idea and effect. It was unauthorized, hence the vampire being named Nosferatu. All of the other characters' names were changed, but it is it is the Dracula story. And the Stoker estate sued over the creation of Nosferatu and won. And all copies of the movie were ordered destroyed. So it could be, you know, in an alternate version of events, we don't really know anything about Nosferatu other than it existed. But thankfully, some prints were not destroyed and we have access to the film today. And they were, you know, smuggled out of the country and like came to yeah. America and people saw the film here and were inspired to do other things with it. But sort of in reaction to the success of this, the Stoker family says we should start doing authorized adaptations, right? So they, they sort of realized that they have something that like people could continue to appreciate and make money off of, right? And so mm -hmm. they do a stage play, the stage play um, eventually is what gets ad ad adapted into the 1931 film. So in 1931, Universal in L.A., right? You know, like Universal Studios, th their back lot in L.A. there, that's where they were making yeah. movies. Mm -hmm. They're making a lot of monster movies. And they, you know, made them through the 50s and 60s. They made hundreds, right? Dracula is not the first Universal horror movie, but it's pretty early. Right. There's a few that come before, Phantom of the Opera, The Man Who Laughs, which we're going to talk about in a future episode. But it is but it is early on. It's like the ninth one, I think. And I did watch it in prep for this episode. And it has many of the things that you might associate with Halloween, like you take for granted, or horror or vampires that I didn't really realize because I hadn't, hadn't watched this movie before this. Have you ever seen this movie? The 1931 movie? Yes, this is Bela Lugosi's Dracula. Dracula, the universal Dracula movie. Okay. Oh, this is the one that you said that you wanted to watch, and I'm pretty sure I downloaded it since then, but I haven't okay. watched it. Okay. This is this is the one that Bob Kane specifically says was an inspiration for him. Got it. Okay. So I hadn't watched it until I was prepping for this episode, and there are many things that you might associate with Halloween that come from this movie, which is really interesting. So, like, the movie opens with a movement from Tchaikovsky's Swan Ballet, um, Swan Lake Swan Ballet. Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah which I instantly recognized as a Halloween song. So I, I definitely recognize this song. Yeah. I don't 
connect it with Halloween. You don't. No, I swear. I, I, I should. I I know you've got a really strong musical background as well, but I think I spent so much time with the Suzuki violin stuff and orchestras sure. and stuff that I just hear Tchaikovsky. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I, I don't know why I associate it with it, but I do. Yeah. And it's uh-huh. got to be like there were like you know haunted houses when I was growing up that played the song or something or like you know when they're running the bumpers between the horror movie marathon on like Naked Night or like I don't know what it is but this this sure, song instantly sure, sure. and it's at the top right like I I sit down to watch this movie to research this episode I hit play and I'm instantly like awash with nostalgia for a movie I've never seen and I'm interested listeners dear listener please I I beg of you if yes. you know this song and you associate it with Halloween but you don't know this movie I want you to tweet at us or like send us an email. Contact at batlessons.com, at batlessons. I want to know. Because, mm-hmm. like, I fully expected Brian to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's not. So I, I, I wonder if I'm an oddball in this. I'm going to go up and I'm I'm going to ask my wife after I'm done with this. Yeah. I'm really curious. Me too. Me too. So who plays Dracula? Dracula is played by Bella Lugosi. And if you hear people talk about this movie, they will call the movie Bella Lugosi's Dracula. He is the most important part of why this movie works. The performance is magnificent. I linked a a short little clip from the beginning of the movie where one of his wives is waking up and they're in a crypt and they shine a spotlight on his face and he just stares at the camera and he's not in monster makeup. He's not in a crazy getup. And the way that he like, it just, he looks like a monster to me. It's really, I think he's just standing there just looking at the camera. Oh, yeah. This is a famous shot. I know this shot yes. for sure. This dude's creepy as heck. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's like literally in this in this minute and 40 second long clip, what what like plays, I can pull, I can pull this image into my head and see it without seeing it. It's this like three second dolly shot where he's just looking at the camera. I'm like, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Um, That's like a very famous shot. Yes. No, no question. Yeah. You could see how someone might be channeling Batman here. It's a good looking dude, right? Who is dressed well, right? Who is just like staring into your soul. This is like a, a scary person, right? To be clear, like Bella Lugosi carries this movie on his back. <laughs> I will talk a little bit more about my feelings on the movie generally in a bit, <laughs> but he is the best part of it by far. I do want to do a little bit digression, a, a little bit of a digression about Bella Lugosi um, because I think there's some interesting tidbits in here. He went on to have a fairly tortured career after this. This was easily his his biggest role. It's one of his earlier roles. It was a big success for Universal, but they didn't really reward him for that. He had very few leading parts. He had um, personal troubles in his life. He was often in debt. And needed mm. the money, and Universal knew that, and they knew he was desperate, and so they paid him very little. Often made a lot less than his counterparts that he was starring in films with, like Boris Karloff. And they treated him poorly in other ways. He would play Frankenstein's monster in a 1943 movie called Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. And in the script, Frankenstein is blinded and cannot see. But in the edit, that detail of the movie is cut. So this results in confusion and derision amongst audiences of reviewers of Lugosi's performance. Because everywhere he's walking is Frankenstein. He's got his arms out front of him, stiff, because he can't see. Right? And everyone Mm. says, this is stupid and it's goofy. And what is Lugosi doing? Right? And it, it, funnily, right, is, is kind of the mental image of we have now of Frankenstein is basically people making fun of Bela Lugosi. And he took the pr- criticism pretty hard. Later in life, he would struggle with substance addiction. And, and so he's kind of a, a tragic figure. I encourage you to learn more about him. I'll link a YouTube documentary um, in the show notes about Bela Lugosi. But an incredible performance. The movie's an early talkie. So this is right as we're starting to get sound people talking voices and there's almost no music at all and i think that lends to the eerie and creepy feel of it there's a lot of tension by the fact that there's just long moments of just complete silence this was universal's only profitable movie during the great depression right this is 1931 while the tone and the vibe of the movie is good and you know i think it's successful for good reason it's actually not great (laughs) on a technical level it because it was made during the great depression the budget was quite low And so most of the movie is lifted directly from the stage play. It involves lots of talking, very little action to speak of, very little special effects. Like they didn't even really Mm -hmm. try with a lot of the special effects. Like there's just a bat on a stick, like someone's like lifting up and down the bat and it's kind of like flapping its wings on the string. And then they just jump cut to like Dracula standing there, right? There's lots of rush storytelling. The movie even kind of ends abruptly. Van Helsing has driven a stake through Dracula's heart 
and he tells Mina and Harker to go away and, and he's going to take care of Dracula and they do. And they just kind of like walk out of the crypt and like walk up some stairs and then like the end. And this was like before there were credits, (laughs) the credits were at the beginning of the movies back then, not the end. So literally there's not a conversation. There's not a, it just ends. It's very awkward. And there's a lot of like, sort of like weird pacing and technical problems with this movie. Interestingly, right. Another interesting note here is that because this is so early in talkies, this is before dubs, right? So today, if you wanted to produce a a movie in multiple languages, you would just have voice actors come in and talk over the top of the video. And then you'd, you'd ship it out with, with that language track, right? Like as a, another, you know, audio channel. So in order to make more money, right? This, what Universal would do is they would shoot multiple versions of the movie at the same time. So there's a Spanish language version of this film. Yeah. And what they would do is they would reuse the sets. They would reuse the script. And in the evenings, they would shoot the Spanish language version of the movie after they had shot the English language version during the day. So they would, they would shoot and edit the movie twice. Yes. Once in English, once in Spanish. Dang. Yes. And what's really, really interesting about this one in particular is that the crew that worked on the Spanish language Dracula would hang out during the day and watch them shoot the English version. And so they kind of took notes about like what worked and what didn't work and like came up with ideas about their framing and what they were going to do oh, with the so cameras. the Spanish version was better. The Spanish version of this movie <laughs> is significantly better from a storytelling oh, perspective, man. from a technical perspective. Like there are yeah. multiple places in this movie. Like there's a scene when Jonathan Harker walks into the castle for the first time and Dracula is standing at the top of the stairs. And in the English version, he's just kind of standing there and it's a wide shot and it lingers for a long time. And it's a little awkward. You can't really see anybody. Mm-hmm. And in the Spanish language version of this film, it's a crane shot. And it, it, the camera sort of like flies up the stairs and comes in on Dracula's face. And it's, it's really cool. It is worth noting that the person who played Dracula is no Bella Lugosi. And so the performance is not very good. Um, okay. But many people who love this movie love the Spanish language version of the film. So if you're interested in it, no I'm told it's well worth watching. Yes. Wow. And this movie ignites the popularity of the novel, of the character, and really um, sets Dracula – in stone as part of sort of the American horror, um, you know, pantheon Mm -hmm. Dracula itself goes on after this to get over 200 film adaptations. So there are 200 different versions of, of Dracula as a movie. Wow. Cinemassacre. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. It's the angry video game nerd. That guy YouTuber (laughs) has a channel where he does. That's actually really funny. There's a a band that I like called from first to last and they Uh had a, a Christmas song come out called Chris massacre. Okay. There you go. I'm kind of curious if there's a connection. Maybe I, I don't know, but, um, he does a, a lot of movies about filmmaking, a lot of movies about horror, or sorry, a lot of videos about filmmaking, a lot of videos about horror. And one yeah. of the ones that he did is like a 30 minute long video where he compares a bunch of different versions of the, of the movie, compares them to, to the book, how accurate they are, how much he likes them. Put it in the show notes. Well worth watching if you're interested in that sort of thing. Okay. But not just adaptations of the book itself. The Guinness Book of World Records cites Dracula as the most portrayed literary character of all time. 272 different film credits. Dracula has appeared in 272 different films. Number two, right, most portrayed literary character is Sherlock Holmes, coming in with only 75 portrayals on film. Wow. Yeah. So Dracula is a a big part of the sort of pop culture history of America. Yeah. I mean, it it makes sense. Like, I I can just think of several movies where, I mean, just even Adam Sandler did a movie where he voiced what? Uh, Dracula. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a kid's movie. Um, okay. Like a cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hotel Transylvania. That's what okay. It's called. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, synonymous with Halloween. And it's it makes sense that this phenomenon, like people like Bill Finger and Bob Kane, would have been like going to the movies and seeing this because everyone was, right? Mm-hmm. So that's Dracula. I think it's pretty convincing as an inspiration. You know, Dracula, man, turns into a bat, Batman, right? Well-kept, wealthy man, has a dark side, strikes fear into the hearts of people. I do, I do want to draw sort of a straight line to Detective Comics number 31, which we finished the last episode with, Gardner Fox issue. Mm-hmm. Ba- Batman chases the monk to Romania, where he's in a castle. There's talk of yeah. werewolves. Definitely directly inspired by Dracula. It's not a Bill Finger book. Um, so it's it's easy to imagine that Bob Kane, Gardner Fox sit in the bullpen talking about the next Batman comics. They're talking about Dracula, you know, that they're talking about the, you know, types of stories they want to tell. So very, very easily to see that as as contributing to the early Batman mythos. 
Okay. So, the 1939 New York World's Fair. So, this is related to, but not to be confused with, the 1964 New York World's Fair. Mm-hmm. 1964 is the one where Disney himself goes and is, like, showing off a bunch of, like, Disneyland stuff. Right. Think of a, the, a World's Fair as kind of like a temporary theme park. It's intentionally only m- meant to be open for a year, maybe two. The first Captain America movie, they have something called the Stark Expo that that Steve Roger goes to. This is modeled after the 1939 New York World's Fair. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of lots of inventions. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's some like really famous things like the World's Fair in Paris is the reason that the Eiffel Tower exists. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. I think that's right. They like they built it for the fair and then they loved it and decided to keep it up. Yeah. Um, I know that Tesla, Nikola Tesla, did a bunch of stuff at the World's Fair to like show off electricity and light bulbs and mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The DC generator, mm-hmm. etc. So, yeah, lots of connections with like the future, like the world of the future and stuff like that. Yes, yes, yes. The New York World's Fair in particular is the largest fair that's ever happened in the United States. 44 million people attended this over the course of two seasons. So they were open for two years, April to October 1939 and 1940. It's uh, two square miles and it had zones on communication and government and transportation, food and amusements, right? And the theme, as you say, was the world of tomorrow. So that's oh, on yeah. all the posters and everything for this, the, the theme for the fair, the world of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of companies use this for advertising. This is where GM and Ford did a lot to sell the United States on cars. There's like videos that you can see of like little models of cities with like interstates and like highways and things running through them like decades before the interstate system is a yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah, two or three decades. Yes. And if you look at it, the... The, these models it's like oh yeah that's a freeway that's like a that's a six lanes so like I, could, I, I that's the 101 that's i5 you know i'm in la mm-hmm. um well, and the timing is really interesting too because 1939 to 1940 world war ii has started yes in europe but um the u.s hasn't gotten involved yet yes and a direct result of world war ii and eisenhower as a general visiting germany and he loved the autobahn and their ability to to move military quickly is what um, started off the interstate system. In fact, I think I 80 that Mm -hmm. comes through us through California and Iowa and stuff like that is the Dwight D Eisenhower highway, right? You are correct. Yes. Yeah. And very, very, very much influenced by the military. There are even portions of the interstate that are intentionally designed such that you could land like a military, you know, bomber on, on the interstate. Right. That's why they're sufficiently wide and, and long and straight and, mm-hmm. and stuff like mm-hmm. that. There is there is a wives' tale about that, like, every three miles, there's supposed to be, like, a one-mile section. That's not true. Right, yeah. But, yeah, it is designed in a way that, like, planes can land on it if necessary. So not just cars, right? This is the place where a lot of people first saw a television set. Mm-hmm. This is the place where a lot of people first saw a color photo. General Electric showed up and was showing off the first fluorescent light bulb. Carrier had a building that they built that was showing mm-hmm. off air conditioning to people. And a lot of people mm-hmm. were seeing that for the first time because I'm a Disney guy, <laughs> little, little tangent, yeah. 1939 world's fair in some ways is an inspiration for Disneyland itself, which opened in 1955, Epcot, right? Well, Disneyland first, sure. primarily because a lot of the exhibits are sponsored by corporations. So it's both entertainment and advertisement, which happens at Disneyland. But then yes, you're right. Epcot. Epcot. <laughs> also Epcot. Big inspiration. It's all for about advertising, yeah. Yes. But like Epcot that like has pavilions for different countries, right? Where you can mm-hmm. try their food and learn about their culture. 1939's mm-hmm. World's Fair has that. That's the government zone. The whole right? world, yeah. But not just that, even the construction, the buildings. They're in the center of the nineteen thirty nine World's Fair, there's a building called the Perisphere, which is basically just spaceship Earth, right? And so in the middle of Epcot. Oh, no way. Yes. There's a geodesic dome. You can go inside, you can ride a ride. If you Google Perisphere, there's a big round sphere building that people can go inside. There's an exhibit inside. It is, <laughs> it is Spaceship Earth. I'm Googling it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, whoa. It yes. is for sure Spaceship Earth. Yes. Oh, and it's like right at the end of this big chunk of water, mm-hmm. like kind of like the mall in um, Washington, D.C., but it it's kind of, I mean, it's also exactly how Epcot set up. Yeah. At the end of a big se- section of water. And there's stuff inside it. Wow. Yeah. That's Epcot for sure. Yes. So anyway, we could do an entire podcast on New York and the the New York World's Fair um, Mm -hmm. and on Disney (laughs) and how they're interrelated. But um, I bring it up because Mm -hmm. DC Comics is in New York City, right? And they use this as an opportunity to promote comics. They were well positioned to take advantage. And what they did was they printed a special comic book called World's Fair Comics. 
It was 96 pages. So that's pretty long. Like that's like a triple size issue, right? Has a cardboard cover. So it's a little bit more durable than a normal comic book. And just like all of the theme books, it's an anthology. So there's a bunch of different stories that, that DC is doing. Yeah. The theme books that DC is doing at the time, it's an anthology just like them, but it's plucking stories from all of the different anthologies. So in the 1939 New York World's Fair comics, there's a story from Superman, which is action comics. There's a story from Zatara, which is in detective comics, right? The Sandman, which I think is adventure comics. So don't quote me on that, right? There's, you know, basically it's a sampler of everything across their line. Right. And they're selling it for 25 cents. And that was pretty successful for them. So when the World's Fair comes back in 1940 for another season, they had another um, edition of the World's Fair comics. If you scroll down a little bit, Brian, you can see yep, it. I see it. In mm-hmm. front of the Perisphere are standing Superman, Batman, and Robin. So additionally, in 1940, they hosted what they called a Superman Day, um, where they had mm-hmm. a bunch of events for kids. Like they had like, you know, races and like other feats of strength that they got to compete in. They like wrote on elephants, right? And they gave away a bunch of these comics. Yeah. Admission was half off that day. Ten cents. Yeah. Children in admission, ten cents. It's on the it's on one of these covers. Yeah, I've got a poster here in the document. I'll put it in the show notes. You can imagine, you know, a bunch of people showing up for what is essentially a big DC ad, right? And they're oh yeah, they're pushing the comics. Well, I mean, if you if you want to like go down that road, sure. you could say that like every experience at Disney, or even like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, it's just a series of advertisements. Yes, right. It's all marketing. It's all public relations and mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. They had such success with this book, World's Fair Comics. It's a sampler of everything that DC has to offer. It introduces mm-hmm. people. It boosts sales of their other books. They decide mm-hmm. to try it as a more regular thing, even as the World's Fair is not continuing. So mm-hmm. in 1941, the following year, they start a new book. And they call the first issue of it was called World's Best Comics. But from the second issue of the comic onward, it was called World's Finest Comics. And it came out quarterly, so four times a year. And had stories mm-hmm. from all of their most popular characters, almost always containing a Batman story and a Superman story. In the 1950s, superheroes become less popular. They had to scale back production of lots of things. World's mm-hmm. Finest at that time goes from 100 pages to about 26 pages. And so instead of having separate Batman and Superman stories, they would have one story where both Batman and Superman are teaming up. And so if you talk to people oh, about World's Finest, that's what they will think of. They will think of it as the uh, Batman Superman team up book. So is this like where the Justice League comes from? Mm-hmm. No, not necessarily. Okay. The, the, that comes from um, the Justice Society of America, but it is where people start to think of DC as more a, a universe, right? Where where stories it, can yeah. cross over and coexist. And it's not just like all of the action comics stories are over here and all of the detective co- comics stories are over there and never the two shall meet, right? Right. Yeah, they're not separate universes. They're a shared universe where Metropolis and Gotham are places you can travel between. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and DC is starting to develop a cohesive brand across multiple of their intellectual properties, right? Yeah. So that's how World's Finest came to be. I chose number three, World's Finest number three, because it has a particular relevance to us for Halloween. I should say the last Batman story we read is from September of 1939, right? So you, what did you just say? March of 1939, Batman's introduced. September yeah. of 1939 that was Detective Comics 31, so we just read. This issue is from September of 1941, so two years later. And the spring... Okay of 1940 is a very pivotal time for Batman. And a lot of things change. That's going to be a really interesting discussion for the future, (laughs) a different episode, but I just want to call out that we are jumping ahead and the artwork, the tone, the content of this is much more formulaic and more in line with what you will come to expect for Batman for decades to follow. After we exit this really interesting period of change in the golden age, the first couple of years, we're probably going to fast forward through a ton of stories that are exactly like this, right? (laughs) So, Yeah, World's Finest number three. You want to read it? Let's do it. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we've got... It It looks just like you would expect a, like a Halloween Batman cover to look like. There's dead trees, or maybe it's just trees with all the leaves off of them. Mm-hmm. Batman is... Looks like Batman is chasing Robin around a fence. In the distance, we've got a huge, larger-than-life scarecrow with bats flapping around it, the silhouetted by the moon. Up at the top says Batman with Robin. It's got the the common like Batman logo with the huge wings and the human head thing. Some sort of like an unfurled scroll, like aged paper 
across the Batman's horizon moves a new and terrible figure, a fantastic figure of burlap and straw with a brain cunning and distorted. Who is this figure whose ludicrous appearance inspires fear, symbolizes fear, fear incarnate, fear walking the streets of Gotham City? Is it that most terrible, most bizarre of all criminals? The criminal, the criminal all will learn to fear and call the Scarecrow. Like a real Scarecrow, he looms bold and frightening, scaring the fluttering inhabitants of the city. Yet from the flock rise the winged, cloaked Batman and Robin to challenge and combat the eerie power of the Scarecrow. Indeed. So this, we're back to Bill Finger at this point. Mm -hmm. Gardner Fox is long gone. And, and Bill Finger has written this and he's doing it kind of in the sort of announcer cadence that if you've ever watched Batman 66, you will be familiar with. Okay. Do you do what is do you have any thoughts about Scarecrow before we dive in expectations? I'm, I'm really curious about the origin. Like, is it just like, is it going to be kind of like Scooby Doo where at the end you like figure out it's just like a person in there or not? Because I know that there's like some Batman characters where it like it, it truly is a non-human like monster type <laughs> character <laughs> um, or like Solomon Grundy. I'm pretty sure he's an actual dead person, <laughs> like a zombie. And so I'm really curious if like what's going to go on under Scarecrow. Is it like a, a dead person that's come back or is it just going to like a dude does the whole like fear gas <laughs> sh- or it's injection or whatever it is. The, 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 the fear, toxin. toxin. Thank you. The fear yeah. toxin. Is that original or is it something that was adapted over time? So I just, I'm curious. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I, I think we're going to answer all of those things. Let's do it. Yeah. So bottom right corner of the cover, there's a first panel. There's a either a child or a very nerdy looking adult. Child. is Okay. There's a child running through a field with a stick up in the air. Like he's swatting at birds, maybe. There's a scarecrow in the background. And it says in the caption, very often an incident in childhood suggests the sort of person that child will be when he has grown up. Such was the case with Jonathan Crane. As a small boy, Jonathan Crane liked to frighten birds. We cut to a panel of a classroom. Looks like maybe a college classroom. There's a man in a suit. And the caption says, when Jonathan Crane grew up, he became a teacher of psychology in a university. This is where we find him today. Gentlemen, this term we study the psychology of fear. Fear, that nameless dread that grips a person when thoughts of terror run through his mind. He's obviously the professor in this college classroom. He's kind of pulling at his jacket like he's, it's like an, kind of an arrogant position. So then uh, in the next one, he has a gun pulled out and he says, notice this gun. Should I point it at you? You would be afraid, but you would be more afraid if I did this. And he turns and he shoots. It's like a vase, maybe. It looks like a vase of flowers. Yeah. yeah I don't I don't understand why you'd be more afraid. <laughs> well, Ricky, well, we'll read on. He says, okay, now you see what the gun can do. It can destroy before you only guessed what it could do. Now that you have seen, you are even more afraid. Simple psychology, gentlemen. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's got these really big bug eyes while he's saying it. He's holding yeah. a gun. He's like, mm. <laughs> After the class is over, Crane nears some other professors. You're coming to the party I'm giving tonight. Don't forget. All except one, eh? He looks so shabby in those old clothes. Positively weird. So it's these old dudes that are friends with each other and are planning on going to a party and intentionally leaving out Jonathan Crane. And Jonathan Crane is walking away looking over his shoulder, seemingly kind of unhappy about that comment. Yeah, th- these are his um, his colleagues. These are other professors, right? Yeah, so his he's peers, being yeah. left out. Well, like, n- notably left out, too, because they said all except one. Not yes. like just a few of us cool dudes, everybody but that weirdo. Mm-hmm. So we cut to later in his home. He's sitting in a chair by himself. He's got his hand on his on his chin. He's thinking and he says, the fools, do they think I would give up my precious books just to buy clothes? Bah, they think I'm strange and I look like a scarecrow, a scarecrow. We skipped a panel. That's OK. They make fun of his clothes. They say like he's the shabby and it's poor. Yeah, yeah, I was reading in that that they make a, they make enough money to have nice clothes and he has crappy clothes so Mm -hmm. what's the deal they judge human values by money 
If I had money, they'd respect me, and I could buy more books. Yes, if only I had money. Lots of money. And this resonates with me, that um, if I had more money, I would just buy lots of books. That's the thing that I would definitely do. So, again, you've got Jonathan Crane teaching in his class. Take the example of the protection racket worked by the gangster. He wants money, so he makes people pay him. And how does he do it? He makes people afraid, afraid, so that they pay him. Yes, he makes them afraid, afraid. And he gets money, lots of money, because people are afraid of him. (laughs) So then back at his house, his distorted brain begins thinking along fantastic lines, along criminal lines. He, He stands up from his chair in his study and he goes, so I look like a scarecrow. That will be my symbol, a symbol of poverty and fear combined. The perfect symbol, the scarecrow. And then three minutes later in the home of a certain businessman. Three minutes? He's moving fast. Oh, sorry. Three nights later. I misread that. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, holy smokes. Three nights later. Go ahead. In the home of a certain businessman. What? Straws? Yes, my friend. Straws. It is my sign. Who? What are you? It looks like Jack Skellington, essentially. (laughs) Like... Very long, thin legs, long, thin arms, just kind of stepping out in front of this this businessman character. It looks very comical. Mm-hmm. No, no pun intended, but like it just looks silly. It is. It kind of strikes me as funny how scared the businessman looks because I think in like a real situation, he'd be like, what are you doing? Not necessarily like as concerned. That's just the way it's drawn, though, I guess. And he says, I'm the scarecrow. I've come to sell you my services. Really quickly, before we move on on from this page, um, yeah. I, I want to call out the way that it's formatted. It has sort of three panels horizontally across the top. And then at the sort of bottom two thirds of the page, it has one panel on the right that's very tall. It's the, it's the entire two thirds. And then on the mm-hmm. left, there's three panels, two that are half height of the remaining space and one that's half of the height of the rating, remaining space. And right. because comics are red, left to right, top to bottom. It's not exactly obvious how you might read this. And so they've numbered it. They've given one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I didn't see the numbers. Yeah. In the upper left-hand corner, there's little numbers in circles. And not even that, not just that, they also have arrows. Arrows. So so from panel four, yeah, there's an arrow that points to panel five straight down. So it's saying instead of going from left from four to seven, right, to this, this double height, thing on the right, you're going to go down and then you're going to go left to right on that row. And then you're going to go back up. This is what we call panel stacking. And it is part of the sort of modern rule set of comic books. You would read it this way. If in a comic book today, without the numbers and without the arrows, they're training us at, in, at this point. Yes. I will say this is controversial. There are people who really, really, really hate panel stacking, but, but the sort of the gist of the rule is, if there are panels that are taller than a single row, then you will sort of treat them as as columns that you will read left to right. So you will read the first column left to right, top to bottom, and then you will move on to the next column. So anytime you have sort of like, you know, the, the gutter comes to a T, you would read everything to the left of the T first, and then you would read it on the right. It's called panel stacking. Um, Interesting. Yes. Sorry for that diversion. No, no, that's interesting. I, I never, ever would have noticed those numbers and arrows if you hadn't done that. It, it, you know what? It, it, it's something that I take for granted now, panel stacking, and the numbers pointed it out to me that this is actually something that is weird. It is, and it's something that people will have trouble reading comic books today. They'll get lost because they, they start reading panel number seven when they should have gotten to five. So Okay, so we're back. We're in the home of a certain businessman, Scarecrow standing in front of him, and he says, you are Frank Kendrick. Your business partner is suing you because you stole some money from business you two own. For a certain sum of money, I will scare your pardon so that he will be afraid to prosecute you. He will drop the suit. Do you want to buy my services? And he says, I suppose so. Why not? If you can stop my partner. So that very night, he visits the the partner. You've got Scarecrow is in the window silhouetted by the moon up above this other person, business partner. He says, I am the Scarecrow. You are Frank Hendrick's business partner. I've come to tell you, you must withdraw your suit against him. Who? Who? <laughs> yeah. The businessman says, also, what a weird way to introduce yourself. Like, I, I see things through the lens of, like, crime all the time. Yeah. And he's, he's like, he's laid everything out. He's like, hi, 
I am a bad guy connected to this other guy. Yes. And you're going to drop that suit because yes. that other guy got me to come scare you. Yes. Like that's, yeah. It's, it's very convoluted. If, if had not in the panels before they had primed us that this is a protection racket, I don't know if I would have been able to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He shows up, scares one dude, says, Hey, your business partner's trying to sue you. I'm going to stop him and you're going to pay me. So he's shaking down the one dude for money to go yeah. and shake down the other guy. It's a little, it's a little, little convoluted. Yeah. Next time we meet, it will be your heart unless you withdraw the suit. You have been warned by the scarecrow. And we see him holding this gun and there's a puff of smoke and a line. And the dude says, ah, you shot me. Which is kind of funny. Kind of like shoots him yeah. in my arm. So then the Batman shows up. The Batman and Robin dart lightly across the rooftops. Did you hear that? Says Robin. Yes. A shot. Something's up. It came from over there. And then they're looking over the edge of a building and he says, what is it? Looks like a walking scarecrow. Come on, Robin. And it says, with the lightness of trained athletes, the duo swing to the nearby nearby building. And they do just that. Yeah, they swing it in front of the moon. Down the fire escape, they race in pursuit of the scarecrow. Come on, Robin. That fellow's fast on his feet. Abruptly, a bullet screams past Batman's head and smacks into the brick behind him. So we kind of see Batman like dodging. And then there's like Mm -hmm. a... A bullet line. It's a zing. And then in the next panel, you see Batman jumping down to the ground from up on uh, the fire escape. He goes, oh, oh, he spotted us. Only one thing left to do. And he's he's jumping down to beat the tar out of him, obviously. I just noticed that it was oh, oh. I always read that as oh, no. What is oh, oh? Uh, oh. <laughs> but it's O-H-O-H. <laughs> I think it's before the U-H for uh, oh. I think it's oh, oh. Okay, okay. And he says, hi, pal. And he kind of like <laughs> As he slams his body into a garbage can. Yeah, so he's got <laughs> he's coming down knees first, both knees onto the sort of like lower back, like the small of Scarecrow's yeah. back, and he's got his fists out in front of him on his head, and he's like with all of his weight, smack, yeah. And Scarecrow's and, falling onto a garbage can. And the high pal thing is just super funny to me. It reminds me of Ocean's Eleven. Like I actually I just watched the trilogy in the, like in the last week with Ali. And um, it's like you've got the twins that don't get along very well. Mm -hmm. And one of them's carrying the balloons and it's all a bit or whatever. And the Mm -hmm. other guy bumps into him and they release the balloons. It goes up to the camera and he's like, hey, watch where you're going, friend. Who you calling friend, pal? (laughs) Who you calling friend, pal? Who you calling pal? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ocean's Eleven is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's amazing. It's It's so so good. good. Steven Soderbergh is is great. I I liked it so much that... um, I arranged for my, so Ocean's 12 came out on my birthday. It was December 10th, whatever year that was. No way. And so, yeah, I arranged for all of my friends to show up and like they invited their friends. And so like I was through Boy Scouts, I was in high school, but I was through Mm -hmm. Boy Scouts. I was friends with some middle schoolers, eighth graders, and they showed up and they invited all of their friends as eighth graders are wont to do. Right. And I remember it's like the first like four rows of this movie theater are like people who are here. (sighs) Basically because of me and everyone hated it. Cause like when you're 14, Ocean's 12 is like not a movie for you. And everyone's like, Alex, why are we at this movie? I was mortified. It was the worst. That sucks. It's a good movie. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good in hindsight. It's, it is not paced like the first one at all. No, it's not. They're all, all three of them are different. Yeah. But um, yeah. Logan Lucky. 14. Have you seen Logan Lucky? It's 2004. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very Steven good. Soderbergh, right? Yes. It, it's so good. It's super good. Yep. Okay. Pleasant dreams, says Scarecrow. So he swings around with some kind of billy club looking thing and cracks Batman in the head. And then Robin says, slug the, slug the Batman, will you? And he's like running towards Scarecrow as Scarecrow's like crouched mm-hmm. over the top of Batman. Scarecrow goes, take that. And he throws the trash can and apparently wallops Robin Yeah, it looks like it bodily. hit him in the chin, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it really nails him, it looks like. Great, great accuracy for a psychology professor. Yep. And Throwing then, a trash can. Yeah. And then we see Scarecrow kind of like jumping over the top of a wall and it says, and with queer grasshopper leaps, the Scarecrow disappears into the black night. I'm really upset that we didn't talk about Spring Hill Jack because that's a, <laughs> this, is, this is a thing he does. He jumps over a wall kind of like this. Yeah. Anyway. Are you all right? Says Robin. Just a bit woozy. That was quite a clout. Oh, oh, sirens. <laughs> Somebody heard that shot. And phone the police. And then we see a newspaper clipping. It says, businessman shot by Scarecrow. And then Frank Kendrick says, do you deny hiring this Scarecrow to frighten 
Harold into dropping his lawsuit? Of course I do, says the businessman. Can I help it if this scarecrow person takes an interest in my affairs? You know we can't arrest you without proof. Come on, boys. I don't like the aroma in this place. Smells like a skunk is loose in here. So the detective leaves. Right, because Scarecrow's there and he fell through a garbage can earlier. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, he's not there. He's not there. (laughs) Oh. This is the first business partner. This This is Kendrick. Got it, got it. And that very night, as Paul Harold reads, gunfire crashes through the room. The scarecrow warns only once. Um, and you see but, like a bullet go through his new, the newspaper that uh, the guy's reading like into his chest. And he's got yeah. like, really surprised eyes. And when the police arrive, there's a policeman talking to another one. He says, Harold yep. murdered. And look what I found. Straw. The scarecrow left this calling card. And Frank Kendrick has a visitor. You killed him? I just heard it on the radio. What difference does it make? He refused to withdraw his lawsuit against you. Now he'll never sue you. And then we cut back to at the uh, president's office at the university. Jonathan Crane is standing there in front of in front of the president. And the president says, we have decided to relieve you of your professorship here. Your teachings are entirely too fantastical, such as you're shooting a gun off in class. We feel... Bah! Who cares what you feel? I have money now. I don't need you anymore. And he's got... He's got a wad of cash. He's a huge wad of cash. It. He's got like yeah. $10,000 in cash. <laughs> it's such a weird way to say I've got money now. Yeah. And that night in his room, Crane ponders, they fired me. Who wanted to be a dull teacher anyway? Now I can have money, more money. So the next panel is a little interesting. It's a newspaper and it's got the scarecrow like kind of out on uh, i don't know kind of looks like a like a snow angel kind of like set up mm-hmm. and it's i'm it looks like it's just referencing that the scarecrow is making more action he's showing up in the paper a lot more yeah um, I, I read this as, as scarecrow is like tearing through the newspaper from behind oh okay i can see that it's kind of abstract yeah it's pretty abstract and now the ensuing days tell of the beginning of the great crime master of the beginning of the days of terror The Scarecrow strikes again and again. Bruce Wayne meets an old friend, the president of the college. So we've got Bruce Wayne here in a blue suit and hat next to the president. And he says, hello, Martin. How are you? What's new? And the president says, nothing much. We people of college usually lead a fairly unexciting life. This Scarecrow, Crane, as we call him, waves a large roll of bills under my nose. And then we've got a thought balloon. It goes, Scarecrow, I wonder. And then he says... And spends all his money on ancient books, you say? Oh, looks like and looks like Bruce Wayne might be figuring it out. Oh, yeah. He's got money all of a sudden. <laughs> he's spending it on ancient books. And they they call him the Scarecrow? Oh, maybe he's the Scarecrow. <laughs> maybe. Adds up. And at that very moment, the Scarecrow pays another call on a prospective client. You, Scarecrow, said another businessman looking dude looking a little surprised and over in the corner you've got scarecrow who obviously came through the window pulling up curtains back yes and you are richard dodge owner of a failing department store being put out of business by a rival something i can remedy if you are interested and scarecrow says i can scare away customers i'll start a reign of terror that will drive them away and the businessman says and into my store. Hmm. It's a bit unethical, of course, but it is the old law of the survival of the fittest. Yes, yes. What a weird way to talk. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the next day. Scarecrow. He. And it's a shadow of a scarecrow um, standing over a woman who's being frightened. We cut to a panel that's kind of wild. We've got like scarecrow standing there and he's like chucking mm-hmm things uh, um and like there's motion lines uh, going away from them like what he's throwing and then at the end of it there's like explosions there's like so yeah. he's got like a grenade or like a like you know improvised explosion of some kind and there's like and smoke, there's smoke out. all over yeah yeah and scarecrow says stupid pack pushing crowding against each other like frightened animals and uh there's a woman running away goes help scarecrow and the caption reads, the bursting of the smoke bomb is a signal for panic. And in the Wayne apartment, Scarecrow, Crane, could it be a coincidence? Now, from the radio, 
Calling all cars, calling all cars, to Fenton's department store. The Scarecrow is starting a riot there. This is another thing. Again, um, if you're familiar with Batman 66, you've got Batman and Robin. They're at Wayne Manor, and they're like listening to the radio, or they're getting a phone call, and they're like, you uh-huh. know, this is this is very reminiscent of, of Batman 66. Pre-Bat Signal and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And then Batman says, come on, Robin, we have no time to lose. And then Robin says, right. And it's really funny. We From one panel to the next, they're not in their suits. And then in the next one, they are, right? So we don't see them change. There's no bat pole. There's no bat cave. They're just suddenly. Yeah. They're in, in instantaneously their in their costumes. And Batman's going, come on, don't be so slow. Yeah. <laughs> An instant later, the Batmobile darts through the city streets. After parking their car, they race over rooftops. You've got Batman and Robin jumping off a roof. Batman says, if we go in this way, by the roof of the store, we won't be seen. Towards the center of confusion, race the Batman and Robin to the Scarecrow. Hi, ugly, Batman goes. (laughs) He's like walking up behind Scarecrow. And Scarecrow is in this department store with a baseball bat smashing plates. (laughs) Those high dollar figure items. Yeah, just doing property damage of uh, yep. dining wear. Stupid Claude says the scarecrow, and he swings a bat at Batman. Batman ducks. You missed. Strike one. Not nice calling people names. <laughs> he punches at him. Yeah. Now down the slippery length of the counter spins the scarecrow, the Batman racing to meet him. You've got just a big long table, and the scarecrow just kind of bouncing funnily on his butt sliding across the top of this yeah so the way this reads to me right is this is like a um like a pharmacy bar like it's a counter like or a meat counter or something like that that where someone would stand behind it and what what's happened is batman has punched scarecrow and like looney tune style he is now sliding from one end oh absolutely agree all the way to the other (laughs) on his butt yeah such a strong punch that he lifted him off his feet (laughs) <laughs> and scarecrow slid across this table on his butt meanwhile it's so hard that batman had to run after him you're right so so, the, <laughs> so batman is in the foreground in silhouette running and there's these really really swift motion lines and scarecrow sliding across the bar and <laughs> batman, batman beats him to the other side and punches him again <laughs> So, nice to meet you. Yeah. He's, he's slid across the bar. It's very, very yeah. cartoon. Very. Uh, yeah. He's he's playing ping pong with himself and on both sides of the table and the ball is Scarecrow. Yes. And that's, that's exactly right. Blundering fool. You think you can take me so easily? And uh, Scarecrow launches off of the table and kicks Batman in the chest with both feet. Meanwhile, Robin finds himself in trouble. Uh, and he's like punching a police officer and he says, sorry, but you're making a mistake. And the other police officer says, stop him. So like Robin's trying not to get taken away by the police. He's beating him up. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I'm innocent. I'll just assault you. <laughs> I'm just a vigilante. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing anything wrong. You're making a mistake. You're going to die, Batman, says uh, Scarecrow. He's got his gun out across the room and he looks like he's going to shoot batman robin looks turns over his shoulder he says hey i gotta stop that maniac in this in this panel that you just read there's there's a sign on the wall that says sports yeah, yeah. so you can tell what what part of i did not thing. realize that that was relevant <laughs> so <laughs> One i didn't would not say think. it <laughs> yeah yeah this is another thing from uh Batman 66, everything is labeled conveniently and in large lettering. Oh, right. From the rack in the sports department, Robin seizes a bowling ball and... So he's picked up a bowling ball from the sports and he's throwing it. Set him up in the next alley. Yeah, the ball knocks Scarecrow off his feet and Scarecrow goes, ugh. The Scarecrow recovers swiftly and scrambles to his feet. His hand digs into his pocket and... So Scarecrow's gotten back up and he's chucking something and it says, I'll finish you with this bomb. (laughs) Again, Robin makes use of the sports department. I hope my aim is good. It had better be. And you've got Robin standing there with the bow and arrow fully pulled, letting go. Yeah. And for the, I mean, the foresight he's got to have to like, (laughs) he just finished throwing a bowling ball. Scarecrow is jumping up, about to throw a bomb, bombs midair. And Robin's like, quick, let me grab this bow and arrow. (laughs) Because that's like the fastest, fast draw weapon around. <laughs> yep. And in the next pa- panel, it says bullseye. And you see the arrow going mm-hmm. through this bomb and it's exploding. And Batman's yep. got his cape kind of up around, you know, his his face. And he's kind of like shielding himself. Yeah. The famous Dracula like arm. It is kind of. Yeah. Yeah. 
It looks like our sawdust friend has given us the slip again, says Batman. And in the background between behind Batman and Robin, you've got the police running out. Hold your fire, men. It's Batman and Robin. <laughs> Which is like <laughs> super funny. Yes. It's like Robin was just beating up these guys. Yes. And and this other police officer's like, hold your fire. They're good guys. Yes. Well, th- th- we're entering an era. Um, again, we're going to talk about you know, 1940 and what happened, but we're entering an era where Batman and Robin are, are duly deputized officers of the law, right? So they're on the same side mm-hmm. as the as the police. So Batman's talking to the police officer and he says, you're too late, Sar- Sergeant. And the police officer says, anybody know if he stole anything? And then this woman who I think is uh, someone who worked at the store says, yes, he took uh, two books from the rare books department. <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone else is jumping ahead with me, <laughs> but... <laughs> Batman's actually Bruce Wayne, who's putting together this whole like scarecrow is a is a nickname for this psychology professor who like loves books mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and suddenly has a lot of weird money. Yes, and, and now they're short two rare books. Okay, yes, from, La- from later the that night. Department stores, rare books department. <laughs> yeah, which I didn't know that department stores commonly had. Oh, you've a never rare been to the rare books department. department? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. <laughs> next time i find myself in like jc penny or nordstrom i'll yeah. ask where their rare books department is there you go later that night so he stole the rare books that ties in very neatly with the man called scarecrow crane leave your mask on so that was batman talking to robin yeah and he's like taking off his mask so we cut to another scene and there's a man who's in a brown hat and a blue jacket and he's at a door and i think he's knocked on it and and jonathan crane is answering And he says, what do you want? And the man says, I beg your pardon. May I use your phone to call the garage? My car broke down. He lets him in. Yeah. To to, to do a phone call. Well, no one had cell phones. This is probably a prepay phone as well. No, I get that. But if I was a criminal, I'd be like, no. (laughs) Who's this random guy who's showing up at my door? (laughs) Yeah. I just wouldn't let anyone in my house if I was a criminal. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Anyway, this rando walks in the room. Ah, rare books. Quite a nice collection, too. You must have spent a fortune on these. And Crane says, that's none of your business. You asked for a phone. There it is. Use it and get out. But once outside, the unwelcome visitor removes his disguise. And here we've got Batman coming out of the blue jacket and the brown hat. And he's got like a a mask. Like he's just taken off his Mission Impossible. He's wearing a a costume outside of his costume. Yes. It's not Bruce Wayne coming out of the the trench coat. It is Batman. Yeah. <laughs> and Robin says, think he's our man? And Batman says, I'm positive. Tomorrow, I'm going to call on Dodge, the department store owner. I'll bet he hired the Scarecrow to start that riot in Fenton's store. The moron. To think he would fool me with such an obvious disguise. Try to question Dodge, will he? He'll find Dodge dead first. So this is Jonathan Crane uh, listening out of his own window from behind a curtain. And then we cut to um, Scarecrow in costume and it says, it's time for the Scarecrow to walk again. As the Scarecrow steps out, a voice floats mockingly towards him from the shadows. And you see Scarecrow kind of like running again, silhouetted against against the moon. And he says, now for who's there? And then a a voice from outside the panel says, the Batman, pal. I knew if I talked loud enough, you'd make a dumb move. Now I have proof that you are the Scarecrow. So the the Scarecrow whips around, pulls a gun out, and shoots it towards Batman and Robin, saying, Trick me, will you? Down, Robin, down, says Batman. Really quickly, I just wanna I just wanna call out what's happened here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Batman has put on a costume. He showed up at the house saying, mm-hmm. I I my car broke down, I need to use the phone. He lets him use the phone. He leaves, takes off the costume, right? Jonathan Crane sees him through the window. Finds out it's Batman. He says, oh, I've outsmarted you. You think I wouldn't notice you changing back into Batman. And then Crane gets on his scarecrow costume, leaves the house, and Batman's waiting for him. And he says, I was counting on the fact that you would come after me in your scarecrow costume. And now I know it's you because you just came out of the house. So they've, they've, (laughs) Crane thinks he's outsmarted Batman. And then Batman outsmarts Crane because they are all in a 4D chess game where they're thinking two steps ahead of each other. It's a little, uh, yeah, stupid. Well, it's also like really convoluted that he, gets into this costume to like make a point of seeing his like his rare books. Yes. And then is out of costume as Batman. Yes. <laughs> when Scarecrow sees him and then Scarecrow's surprised when he runs into Batman in a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> the whole, convoluted is the perfect way to describe the story. 
Yeah. With his queer grasshopper loops, the scarecrow bounds and sprints away the dynamic duo in full pursuit. He's going into that playground, says Batman. And then we see Robin sort of jumping over a wall onto a swing set. And he says, now this will be a nice, nice trick if it works. And out springs the boy wonder. And so he's like swinging off of the swing set. He's like, he's not sitting. He's on his feet, right? Yeah, and he's he, jumping. And he's jumping towards the scarecrow. And it says, it's that meddlesome boy again. But the scarecrow's bony knotted fist smashes him full in the face. You have to be quicker than that, which is like a great way to describe the situation where Robin's being all clever and a gymnast. And he's going to jump and get Scarecrow in like mid air, like like a, a baseball bat hitting a pitch. <laughs> <laughs> His bony knotted fist smashes this kid's face. <laughs> and then and then we've got scarecrow standing over the top of robin's body he's like slumped over on the ground he's got a gun and batman says mm-hmm. drop that gun and scarecrow says i'll finish you first then your pal and then <laughs> the, caption, the caption says but the scarecrow is too intent upon evil to note the still flying swing and and the swing cracks him right in the back of the head <laughs> oh my goodness so they caught him on accident. <laughs> yes, the, the swing hits him in the back of the head. Uh, as the scarecrow reaches for his fallen gun, the Batman leaps. A shot blasts past Batman's face as they lock in a terrible struggle because they're fighting over the gun, obviously. The scarecrow says, you'll find I'm as good at fighting as you are, Batman. Once again, the scarecrow stoops for his fallen gun when Robin enters the fray. So scarecrow is bending over to pick up a gun from the ground and his butt is positioned right underneath or right over the top of a seesaw teeter-totter whatever you call that and you've got robin who's in the air coming down on the other side and he says hold that position and he jumps down on the other side of the, of the seesaw and it comes up and smacks scarecrow in the butt he kind of flings him in the air a bit yeah batman zips in Dex him, kind of an uppercut. Little alley oop action. Up. Yep, gets him off his feet. Nice timing, kid. And then Robin says, Wow, is he really out at last? I don't know. He certainly gave me the fight of my career. But from now on, the only fighting he'll do is in a prison cell. And so the infamous short lived career of the Scarecrow comes to an end at last. A weird phrasing, say the short lived career end at last. Like, <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> you're right i didn't think of that that is pretty stupid <laughs> so then uh yeah the scarecrow is standing there in a cell with his hands on the bars he goes the stupid fools actually think they're going to keep me here uh and the final caption says will the scarecrow return only time only inscrutable time can tell so that the is end. the first story of the scarecrow um mm-hmm. this is batman hitting its stride all right on this page in the middle top panel we have Batman grinning as a gun is being shot in front of his face. It's kind of the, the jolly Batman, right? It stays this way basically until the 80s, right? This is the tone. You can see a lot of Bill Finger in this. If you remember Partners, Partners in Peril, the very first story, it's like businessmen are having like contract disputes and Batman's getting involved for some reason. It's the same thing, right? Scarecrow is showing up and like helping businessmen like scare each other twice like one is trying to get a lawsuit dropped the other is like trying to like boost up one department store over the other and batman is like fighting that costume criminal so that's the same but but we're also kind of getting sort of the fantastical element that bill finger is bringing to it right where we have this you know dude in a ridiculous get up right and they're fighting in sort of ridiculous scenarios that that bill finger will become well known for where you know you've got the the gigantic penny and the gigantic typewriter and the gigantic record player and like we're starting to get these they go to like really exotic settings right in gotham to have these ridiculous fights we have you know batman being on the side of the law it is it is different than the golden age batman that we have read up until this point what do you think of it i mean it's fun it's definitely like silly less like gritty than some of the other ones we saw like nobody died in this one that's right uh no no he did shoot that one guy. Scarecrow did shoot. Scarecrow the, shot the, someone. Yes. Scarecrow, but Batman didn't kill anyone in this one. Yes. Yeah. Lots of fun quips. I mean, it's and just the jokey manner within the fighting to say like, 
I don't know. He essentially said special delivery before he punched Scarecrow in the face on while he's sliding across that table, you know? Yes. So, yeah, l- lots of fun fun stuff happening. But it's also, like, goofy enough that it, we can sit here and en- enjoy kind of tearing it apart. Yeah, for sure. It's it, it, we're, it, we're getting into more kinetic cartoony action as well, right? Yeah. The stories we've read up until now are, like, six to ten pages. This is 13, right? So the stories are getting longer. There's more action in them, right? We've We kind of, like go from set piece to set piece where they're they're doing yeah cartoon violence what do you think about scarecrow specifically you had you said at the top you were wondering whether he was going to be like a monster or just a dude he's a dude he's a psychology department he's really focused on fear so all of that kind of like adds up with where he's going but he doesn't like gas anyone he doesn't have the toxin Mm -hmm. he seems to be like kind of a misguided frustrated person not like a deeply evil Mm-hmm. being mm-hmm. so like i can this is a really obvious seed that was at the beginning of like the the plant that grows out of this you know mm-hmm. and scarecrow appears one more time in the golden age bill finger will will write another scarecrow issue but only one no and way. he ends up being not a very important character for a long time until the 60s when none other than gardner fox revives scarecrow as an important and recurring villain and huh. remains in the rogue gallery from gallery from then on the rogue gallery that's what they call the villains you've never heard it called a rogues gallery i don't know i don't think so okay yes that is that is um superheroes when you have a set of villains that go with a hero that it's called their rogues gallery in the case of the flash specifically in canon like in the stories they call themselves the rogues i don't know where the no term way. rogues gallery comes from now i'm gonna google it a rogues gallery is a police collection of mugshots or other images of criminal suspects kept for identification purposes. So we've got the New York police department here and there's two dudes standing in front of a wall of mugshots. Oh, it's like a literal like image gallery. Yes. A rogues gallery. So like you get a call from someone that says I was just mugged and this was his description. They go and they look at the wall and they say, okay, which dude was it? It's kind of cool. I didn't huh. know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I just noticed that it said Bob Kane on that last thing. So I'm going to keep an eye out and see if it's like how often it shows up. Cause I'm guessing it's just like the title page and the last page or something, but it yes. does make me wonder if it's starts like kind of peeking out all over the place. I mean, the dude's in love with himself. He is in love with himself and I don't know a hundred percent for sure. I wish I did 1941. So he probably was involved to some degree at this point. Jerry Robinson has been hired at this point. So he may be doing the art. I don't know. For sure. I know around 1943, Bob Kane, Batman gets picked up as a newspaper strip syndicated. Bob Kane still sees that as a prestigious thing that that to be sought after to be in the newspapers. And Mm -hmm. so he goes on to, to sort of more directly do the arts in the, in the Batman newspaper comic strip. And Jerry Robinson basically starts being the main artist at that, at that time. So, um, I, I could, I wish I had done more research. I don't know whether Jerry Robinson did most of this art. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he's the one that actually drew this. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. If you like the show, then you can help other people find us. Tell your friends about the show if you think they'd be interested. If you're using Apple Podcasts, tap on the name of the show, scroll down, and find the place to give us a review. All you got to do is tap the stars. But if you write a review, we will read it on the show. If you're using Overcast, hit the star at the bottom of the now playing screen to recommend us. It helps us a lot. If we grow an audience, we can keep putting out episodes. You can find all our episodes and show notes at batlessons.com. You can send us comments, questions, corrections, or even suggestions to contact at batlessons.com. Or you can tweet at us at batlessons. Until next time, I'm Alex Cash. And I'm Brian Anders. Thanks for listening. I had to make a comparison. He looks kind of like Rafe Fiennes, Voldemort. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see, I could see that for sure. They they may have intentionally been trying to channel Dracula when they were doing the Voldemort. Um, that would be really interesting. Anything else you want to say about Dracula before we move on? Dracula, Dracula's a. B- no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, nothing comes to mind. I guess I feel like we've hit on a lot. I I added some links that you might appreciate. One is. 
for a seemingly not very short. Uh, okay, it's not that long. Not that long um, thing on the Leaky Cauldron dot org <laughs> essay. Um, villains in Dracula and Harry Potter. And mm-hmm. one of the things that jumped out to me, second paragraph, first sentence. The first and most obvious similarity between Dracula or Voldemort, Tom Marvolo Riddle, is their looks. Stoker is quick to describe his title character and does so at the reader's first meeting of Dracula. And it, it goes on from there. I didn't want to <laughs> read and like lose track of what you were talking about, but that was a sentence that jumped out. So I commented it in yeah no for sure and this is this is a lot of academics when they're talking about the book talk about this passage specifically because it is in some ways not exactly aligned with what we think of as a vampire tall old man Mm -hmm. clean shaven long white mustache clad from black and head to toe without a single speck of color in him anywhere so just a pale kind of old guy right yeah not not some uh, monster like nosferatu is like kind of a ghoul right dracula is not that in fact, he's yeah. kind of dapper. And so the more I think about this, the more it's like, yeah, I get it. I mean, Voldemort, he can't die. He's the, mm-hmm. he is like, he does everything at night. You never hear anything about him mm-hmm. and like the sun touching him, you know. He is essentially raised from the dead, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's another, it's, it's interesting. Like, I don't know. I see it more and more as I think about it. Everything's a remix, right? Everything's a remix. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm-hmm. It's a movie that you hate. (laughs) (laughs) 